the passing of the, the creation of state tribal compact schools was a really pivotal moment for educational equity for tribal communities. Because with the passing of those tribal compact schools, it allowed tribes to receive 100% of per pupil funds, right? So we weren't losing that, that money that was being um, kind of taken off the top in administration through interlocal agreements. So now we're kind of recognizing that educational sovereignty. And now we have seven compact schools in the state, I think right now. And then two years later in 2015, the legislature mandates the implementation of the since time immemorial curriculum. And it's, it's really nice to see that we are, we, we, we're gonna see this trend that we start from a place of importance and pass legislation that represents our values, but we also need to back it up, right? And so we, what we require really expresses a lot about what we value in education. So this is something that we as a state agree is really valuable. Next one. So I like to put this up here um, and Bill kind of keyed in with me a little bit too. Um, I think it's important to recognize, I think how far we've come, but also how far we still have yet to go. Um, so we are still very much in, in the process of making history. So we have these really important symbolic uh, moments within our state. And I think that these achievements say a lot about our state and also the increase of visibility and representation in the role that that plays in our communities. So the more that we can see people, the more that we can celebrate their accomplishments and we can also better understand and interpret the impacts that they make in the communities that they live in. Next one. So 2019, man, we had a lot of stuff going on then. So Bill and I had been working together for a long time uh, when he was the education director for the Nisqually tribe. And a lot of the work that we did was sort of on a daily, you know, like day-to-day -day student support, right? What sort of after-school programming can we provide? What sort of events can we provide students? Um, and we were quickly realizing that uh, the more that we engaged on a project such as the Since Time and Memorial curriculum, we ended up gaining more interest and there became a need for a greater and greater sense of capacity. So um, 2018, I think, it was, I think it was 2018, our district created our Since Time in Memorial Committee in which uh, Bill was part of. And what that did, so we, so taking this mandate and trying to internalize its operation, we created an in-district committee with which we can um, sort of channel resources, but I think also better understand all the great work that was being done across our district, right? Because we have teacher librarians doing incredible stuff uh, with representation in children's literature. Uh, we have science teachers engaging in STI and social studies teachers and music teachers. So we need to pull all these partners together along with tribal representatives to kind of figure out the next step, to, to put the pieces together. And as we kind of kept going and kept going, our, our two communities became stronger and stronger. And one of the things that had always been really important to me is that we need to be able to demonstrate the inclusivity of our community beliefs in some, in some sort of tangible way, right? But if we're gonna be teaching about tribal sovereignty, we need to recognize it. So in a, in a meeting, I think we were uh, just chilling with uh, Willie in Hanford one day. Um, and I, I mentioned the idea of flying the Nisqually flag at all of our schools. And we were all excited. And I think Mike was so excited. I think he actually beat me back to the office that day to start asking questions like, can we do this? And then it's like, oh, well, yeah, we can. So that began its own uh, fascinating uh, process. Let's go to the next one. So as we got into the, the flag raising, Mike would then come into my uh, office. It's like, well, we're gonna need a land acknowledgement, right? Because we have to make sure that people understand why this flag is so important outside of our buildings. Um, and then he came back a little bit uh, later. It's like, well, we should probably have a district-wide lesson plan, right? Because it's one thing to have it, and it's one thing to to recognize, right? Because we can have the politics, the 
there's a downside to the politics of recognition, right? You can make concessions and you can accommodate things, but you're not really sacrificing or altering the systems of power in any sort of meaningful way. So how can we make sure that we create a system within our district in which um, every year 14 and a half thousand students have access to a lesson, grades K through 12, about the importance and significance of land acknowledgements, why that Nisqually flag flies, uh, as well as understanding uh, Nisqually culture and history, but also their contemporary presence and contributions to uh, our communities and the state. And this kind of, we just kind of ended up uh, as a district and working with the tribe just in this cycle of yes and, like what next, what next, what next. And so since we were on a policy kick because policy makes permanent, uh, we had to make a policy about the land acknowledgement, right? Because it's one thing to have it, but then if you never use it, what's the point? Right. And are you actually doing more harm if you never use something that you set out to do? So we had to create a district policy about the land acknowledgement. We had to create a district policy about flying the Nisqually flag, all of which uh, received unanimous uh, school board support from uh, our North Thurston School District. And one other thing that was really passionate to me at the time, what well, still is, is the right to regalia. So uh, for a number of years, uh, our state superintendent has issued letters of encouragement to school districts across the state that to encourage school leaders to allow the wearing of traditional regalia for graduation. And just, you know, just a couple years ago, did it finally become law? And so before the state adopted it, I was pushing in my district, uh, I was sitting with our school leaders, like, I want, we need to do this. Like, we need to have a policy where students aren't shamed, um, aren't embarrassed, um, and they don't have to have the sense that they have to advocate to express themselves in a way that they have since time immemorial. Because the reality is, like, this... This eagle feather that I have on my hat would keep me from graduating and walking in many states in this country to this day. And so we need to make sure that we not only symbolize our commitment, but we also recognize the, the importance of the safety of inclusion and being able to express and be safe in the way that you present and bring honor into such a celebrated moment as graduation also all the while being mindful of the, the sort of transformative revitalizing power of having that expression in a public school system that has worked for 150 years to assimilate and destroy our culture. So we passed a uh, right to regalia policy in our district a few days before the state did, but we beat the state to it. Um, and I encourage all of you if you don't already have a right to regalia policy in your district, I encourage you to do so. Because while this is a unique and distinct group of people that are probably well up to speed on various RCWs and love to go to leg.wa.gov, um, most people aren't. So the access, right? If, if the equity that we implement isn't accessible and knowledgeable to our families and our communities and our staff, what are we really doing, right? It shouldn't come down, like, whether or not a student can cross a stage with pride and honor shouldn't come down to the luck of the staff coordinating that graduation. And so while we have the RCW, one another great step that you can make is go back to your districts um, and encourage people to get this RCW into your student handbooks. So that way it's more accessible to all of your students and families and make sure like, you know, all your counselors and support staff that support graduation uh, understand that this is a right. So that way we can sort of break the cycle of violence that so many Native students go through. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so having spent a, a good portion of my career sort of training and supporting uh, district staff, and people across the state in 
uh, learning about and how to implement the Since Time and Memorial curriculum, and also just being a Native educator and chatting with my colleagues over the years, one of the biggest loopholes that we saw when it came to the consistency and implementation of STI was that there, there was this huge op, like training gap in administration. So the state passes a mandate that we have to teach it, right? So now it's like a, a teacher issue, right? So teachers are going to the trainings, they're doing it in their classrooms, but the school leaders who are in charge of evaluation and um, setting instructional goals for their schools, don't have to know anything about it, right? And so that, that causes an inconsistency in implementation, which again, also negatively in fact impacts like the equity and education piece, right? Again, the, the quality of education that you, you, you get, as well as the ability to see yourselves in your education shouldn't come down to like sort of the, the luck of enrollment. So uh, again, working with uh, Mike, uh, Willie, Bill, and Hanford, we came together and said, well, maybe we need a piece of legislation for this. And this is where House Bill 1426 came up. Um, prior to this time, there's really no sort of expectations on how administrators would get their 100 hours of recertification time. And it's like, well, maybe if we put some parameters on that, we could provide more opportunities for our school leaders to get meaningful instruction that helps them better improve their buildings, better improve their districts. And so within this one, we kind of started this, this trend of like, well, if we value equity, well, we should probably expect people to learn about it. And also more importantly, um, give those who are passionate about it a reason to engage even more. So within this 25%, uh, we have five hours set aside for government to government consultation and collaboration, uh, which is kind of why we're all here today. And uh, Mike and I were working on, on the training and we've been doing a lot of traveling to sort of uh, increase this awareness and working with the state as we look to the future and how this gets unfolded. Next slide. So another great year. Um, that uh, Representative uh, Lakanov was behind was the banning of offensive Native school mascots. Um, and again, I mean, 2021. And if you want to talk about being like, the most recognizable and visible minority in this nation, it was only until last year you could still offensively depict us in our public school system and it not cause a problem. And it's still so odd. I, Mike and I were talking on the way up. Um, I was, I was uh, uh, presenting to one uh, group of educators and this, this, this topic came up and they, they had a school, they were, they were the Indians. And while they, could, they said they could understand like why we need to do this, they were still upset because we're the Indians. It's like, no, you are white. Um, and but so it, it this, it's this, this cycle, right, that we have to, that we, that our invisibility and sort of the, the racist stereotypes of Native people have been so embedded within American society that the offensiveness itself is invisible. And that's really, a, a, to overcome that is truly transformative and I think can really inspire and guide our work. Because the reason why you know, we, we put in all this effort is to be able to see the things we can't see so we can lift up the students who need it. Uh, next one, I think we're towards the end of the homework part. Yeah, me, um, it's also nice to be here with Brooke. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is, this, is really, uh, this is a really exciting and meaningful moment and I'll kind of talk more about uh, my journey uh, in this, but we're just, Washington State's on a roll, right? and we continue to be leaders, and I think it's just nice to kind of point that out. Next one. So building off uh, House Bill 1426, um, and this is kind of expected. So during, as we were writing House Bill uh, 1426, it was initially just targeted for administration, but then it came back to us asking if we would expand it to all certificated uh, staff in the state. Of course, we were like, yes, that sounds wonderful. Let's do it. And uh, so it only makes sense that in a future legislative session, 
that that requirement to engage in government to government collaboration would be expanded to effectively all school leaders. Because in addition to um, being federally required to engage in tribal consultation for various title programs like Title VI, um, consulting with your local tribes is just good practice. Um, whether you have a federal mandate or not, uh, every one of your schools resides on native land. And so it's really important that we engage in this nation to nation uh, work uh, to benefit the educational communities we live in. And next one. Okay, I think we're up to Mike. Thank you, Jared. So, um, Government to government collaboration is the process of healing. Um, Jared kind of highlighted the, the recent history from 2013, and, and we know, you know, some of us might be more knowledgeable than others about the history before that, right? So education is a process that was done to our Native American people. Um, these laws that we had to go through and changing and get more, um, uh, get more clarification on what we should be doing was really about uh, setting the stage for the next people to take take on, right? And what we identified is that our school leaders really do need a different set of skills and a different set of abilities. Um, so what we're about to do is we're about to hear what a initial government to government training segment might sound like, right? But to do this, we have to put ourselves into, a, into a, the right frame of mind, right? So we're gonna imagine that we are all uh, school leaders or students who sit on the traditional lands of the Nisqually people. And we are all here today and we're going to hear from the Nisqually people, right? As a, as a first um, way to hear about traditions, culture, people, values, beliefs, uh, and that, that really important history of why things exist the way they exist today. And then as leaders, as students, as representatives, we can then think about what is our process for improvement. So my part's really simple and easy. I get to I get to introduce the shine, which is Mr. Hanford McLeod of uh, the Nisqually <laughs> tribe. But that's that's the uh, the area I want you to think in is that we are all residing together and we are all working together in a very small community to help students in our community. So with that being said, here's Mr. Hanford McLeod. Stop! Stop, Dev! Stop! Um, thank you, Mike and Jared. And for all you here today, I appreciate the time that you take out of your day and even this meeting to have us come in and just say a few words or uh, show a few slides. <clears throat> Let me uh, kind of get into uh, character here. These guys I've been driving, but um, go ahead and go to the first slide for me, please. I'll uh, have control of that or do you guys have control of that? Yeah, we'll, we'll do a couple of come on. Couple more, and then uh, Hobi Kudai Ham from McLeod. I grew up on a Nisqually reservation located outside of Olympia or Yelm. Went to school at Yelm. Uh, they say graduated in '94. I grew up there. My family still lives there today. In Yelm, what I say to kids there is in the extension of what Nisqually is. So Nisqually is or Squally Opsh. Squally Opsh means people of the river, and then people of the grass also. And those words, you know, when you when you hear our language and our dialect, it does sound like a lot of what you hear around Tacoma, Mount Tahoma, um, Tacopid, uh, and a lot of those those words because Lushai, who I have behind me here, who we call our appointed chief, he was not a chief. He come from a predominant family over in Yakima. His, mom, his mother was a princess over there from a family. So his dad over here on this side was from the, we'll call it the Mayshell Village, located outside of Eatonville. And Lushai, as he grew into this leader form in the early 1800s to the mid 1800s, because of, of just how he could deal with settlers and how he could deal with people in general. And he had this, this way of hearing language. And our language wasn't just words, it was actually sign language too. So we had, we had sign language also, or our hand language for a lot of what we did, um, especially with the salmon, the river, and the mountain. But also through that, um, Lushai, as you read, I'll read this saying right here, and some of you can't read it, maybe you, some of you can see it, but it says, whatever the future holds, teach children. Teach your children children, and teach their children. And so that's kind of where I'm at in this generation. 
So we'll say eight generations from signing of the Treaty of 1854, we call it Medicine Creek Treaty. It was signed down on the flats in front of our mouth of our river. And they brought in all the villages because we weren't tribes. Tribe come from another standard of where it came from overseas. And so they just grouped us into these words. And these villages we had were located along the mouth and along tributaries into this river. So Nisqually flows all the way along. And I have these, I'll have these slides that I show um, throughout this presentation, but I just wanted to kind of give you that, that, uh, that visual, like Mike said, because I take these kids back and we talk about dates and times because that's, that's kind of important in today's date. Kids hear that. Well, when was that? What date was that? January 6th. We'll hear that for a long time. So I always remind them of December 26, 1854 is when we signed the treaty. And when we signed the treaty in December of 26, it was because water is sacred to our people. And when you go down to this space, now we're thinking 300 years ago, okay? It's not like today. We walk down there and you got cars flying across the I-5. So we'll go back to a time. Everybody saw uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's movie called Revelant, correct? Chief running across the prairie in the, in the valley looking for his daughter. That's real. That's true. That's what happened in our village back in 1820, right? So these, these settlers who moved in, then... Then, of course, there was us, Squally Ops, you know. Um, let me, uh, I lost train of thought. I hate when I do that because I got so much I want to talk about, right? And, but Mike says, you got two hours to so slow down. So let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> and we'll go to the next slide after that, please. Uh, these slides we put together were to also show kids of, of, of our area. So now this is pre-treaty, correct? Yes. And when we talk about that revelant in, in that show, you can see the Cascade Range, I tell the kids. And, and you think about that time, there wasn't snow, it was rain, there was a lot of rain. Um, it rained all the time down here. Some of you are, are figuring that out, but it rained probably 10 months out of the year back then. We didn't have sunshine unless you went up and towards the mountain. So during, during those early 1800s, you know, we'll go from 1800 to 1830. And that movie Revelant, you know, is, is also another one I look at at Netflix with Jason Moama, who plays in called Frontier. And they talk about the, the furs and they talk about the, 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 the companies and, and those are all real. Okay, those are all true today. That's what brought Hudson Bay down to us pre-treaty. Okay, and so we talk about Fort Nisqually here, but there's another one that it was called Fort Wilkes. And, and Fort Wilkes was 1824 to 1827. And never a little bit earlier than, than the government, I call them, before Governor Isaac Stevens. But when, when Fort Wilkes showed up, that's what brought wealth to our people in our region. We already had the wealth. We talk about it. Uh, Uncle Billy talks about when the tide goes out, our tables were set. So you go down to the wildlife refuge today and you see what we got going with the flow of the water coming back in towards I-5. So now 300 years ago, we're across this same flat right here. And when they landed right here, again, they passed all these other watersheds coming down. I just drove all the way past them on my way up here, Skagit, Tulalip, Puyallup. They did the same thing coming down on their boat, their big vessel, the schooner, uh, Vancouver. It was a, uh, not only a um, agricultural, Puget Sound agricultural company, but it was a fur company reaching out to, to extend their arm of wealth. And this was the area they picked. And they set up that uh, that fort right inside of Fort Lewis, and during and during that during that early times like that, uh, uh, you could see, you know, guys running around just like on that movie. And and during our time, we had a fort. So again, fort is where we had to go to get all of our goods. But Fort Wilkes brought better like funding. You know, they they paid us for the work we did. Uh, uh, they took in our our villages. Married into him, John McLeod, where, where half of McLeod's name comes from. He was an entrepreneur there. Peter Kalama, John Kalama, uh, William Packwood, uh, John Longmire, and James Tomey. There's one other one. I always forget that one other one. Uh, and the seven that were brought down here to put together this company, married into the Nisqually village is. Okay, so the villages roam from like Tacoma today all the way out to Graham and Fredrickson as you go out towards the mountain and then swung down around Alder, Eatonville, 
and even down that way a little bit further towards uh, Windlock and Titlow or uh, Windlock down that way. And, and these villages, again, were located around this mountain and this water. So we call the mountain, and this is something I've been working on for a few years. I no longer sit on the tribal council chair, but I'm the intergovernmental liaison for a lot of municipalities and even these parks. So Mount Rainier is what we want to change it back to Tacoltma. Tacoltma. Tacoltma means don't forget the water. Grandpa Billy, um, Will, Billy's right dad, so we'll call him Willie Sr., was also my grandfather's father because he married into my great-grandmother, who was Angeline Tobin. So when he used to talk this language, he spoke 16 different dialects, and he could interpret a lot from all the way up to Vancouver, B.C., on this map up here in the corner, all the way down here by Portland was how far that language roamed. It's the Lushootsee language, but there's also dialects inside that Lushootsee that go all the way up into Canada. So Willie, after Andrew passed, married into Angeline, who had three children. And, you know, this, this property that, that he has outside of, of where the fort is or where, 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 we hear, where we hear the fish wars happen, right? So before that fish war, though, we're back in the early 1800s. Next slide, please. Let's see if I can get this. Um, there it is. So a lot of what we see here are proposed reservations that we had going on. Uh, any of you been to Tomey State Park? I know we're pretty high up here in the area, but Tomey State Park down there by Lacey, you've walked all along that, that trail. It went up into the region. It's like a two and a half or four mile hike or something like that round trip. That's where one reservation sat one village. And in that village, this is where Governor Isaac Stevens said, hey, let's just push them all over here. You're talking almost a million natives running around. They wanted to push us all into one area. That's what started the war. And the war was the fact that Lushai said no, because now you got this village down here and this village up here, and you're going to put us in an area that we do not know of. And uh, so we had this, we had this war and that's, you know, we see this proposed shot up here of the reservation. We said, no, um, our main reservation, you'll see there's a uh, Medicine Creek council grounds. So during that time, again, this was not just the Nisqually people. This was a lot of people coming in together. So at um, Billy Frank Jr. Wildlife Refuge, you've been there. You guys all been down to that, that beautiful wildlife refuge. And when you walk on that or get back on I-5 heading south on that on-ramp, <laughs> this, is, this is what Washtenaw did for us to, to locate where the treaty was signed. They put a marker there that says next exit, Chipotle, Hawks Prairie, Taco Bell. Instead of putting a marker there that shows the treaty tree, they put, a, they put an on-ramp sign, I said. And that, that, that's for them, too, because they don't remember where it was, because they laid I-5 right across that council grounds right here, right there. And then you see, can we go to the next slide? I think there's a bigger, bigger picture of the fort. So then you see the bigger picture of what we had, 14,417 acres. And we lived there for 68 years before they condemned that and took that also under the umbrella of military. That was called JB, it was called Fort Lewis right here. They, they paid all of our ancestors, like I say, uh, Willie Sr. He took his and over here along the, along the Delta, on the other side of Muck Creek, he bought that land we call Wahilud Indian School in Frank's Landing with his money, with his dad's money, we say. So great, great grandpa. So ours on my mother's side, because she's a Wells also, um, he got $1,200. They had to go to Everett, so just up here from the Squally. So this is 18, we'll call it 1901 or 1902 when all this started rolling. Then by 1910 to 1912, there was the land grab and said, okay, go ahead and go and mark your spot over here. So that's where you have all these uh, ranches and all these uh, sheep ranches that showed up, out, especially along the rivers. Because when you seen the river at that time, 350 years ago, uh, John McLeod stood there and said he has never seen such pristine green grass in all his life. And he come from Scotland. And he was a well-educated, he come from a predominant family. He had the money and the wealth to move. So he married into all these villages along. I got family up here in Swinomish. 
that are named McLeod. So, so he, I'd say, John, he followed the salmon, right? So you could, you, could, you could set your clock by the salmon and by the tides. And that's where you get these runs that come in like, like now in August or July. So the permanent reservation, right? So you see 1856 after we signed it of 1854. Um, next, next slide, please. And this is how it was, this is how it was drawn out. This is how it was allotted to us, called allotted land. After we signed the treaty, and, and I know I'll have uh, Bill come up and talk about the treaty, but that document, you know, that binding document that we still have, that we still talk about today. And we're still arguing with this big army today about this property. No, well, I won't get into that right now. Let's, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> Well, not only for that, we have a, what we call an honor walk every, what was it, every spring top COVID hit, and then they've been pushing us back and rearranging us, and, and they're taking the, the camp, they call it, they still call it Camp Lewis, still call it Township 18, 19, you know, and, and so um, it's not only the, the honor walk, because maybe go back one more slide, please, on that, on that allotted land, you see our riverbed right here along this ridge right here. So that was a key part of what we wanted to keep inside of, of, of who we are. Because again, they were taking us from this river. They kicked us down from the mouth. So along that beautiful flat, um, you had the Braggett family and you had the Brown family. And they were the two biggest families. They came in and they took probably 1,500 acres apiece between those two families right here in our, in our flat. So here you can see the lines. So what we did is we created a walk from right here at the beginning of this allotted, allotted map to remind them of that, of that a binding agreement that we have when we signed it with them. So then we walk along this seven mile stretch and then we walk down to a hatchery that we built back in 1980. One of the biggest ever, again, you know, I mean, that was one thing, that was one good thing that military helped us do was build a beautiful hatchery down here at the mouth of this spring water and well water that we have. So that, that way now <clears throat> you drive along Pacific Highway to get to Yelm and uh, you'll see all that water running down the hill still today. So there's a lot of, lot of cold spring water right here on this hill right here. Next slide, please. So Camp Lewis, that, again, that was the big, that was the big movement. And, and my study is, my finding is, they didn't wanna be a railroad city, town, country so we turned it into a military city and town of course the railroad came from somewhere else so that was not connected to who we were but as it came through that again that was one of the big pushes that that was going on during that time was the railroad governor isaac stevens come from that Me mexican war to push that railroad through there and now to come through here he already knew how to deal with indigenous hostile people and that was one of his key things. So the war, there's a lot of books out there. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, talk of this war. Um, what we're gonna do, maybe go to the next slide, please, is we're gonna develop a state park up in that area. It's not there. But then again, here's, here's that uh, Klamath Creek, Clear Creek. These are, these are two of the main hatcheries today that feed a lot of what we see on the salmon that come through right here. Uh, the Chinook, the Spring Chinook, the Coho, the Dog Sam, the Chum Salmon. Um, we released a lot of them from our our Klamath Creek Hatchery here, and then our Clear Creek Hatchery right here. And those are some of the two biggest ones. I know we turned Clear Creek into one of those uh, orca orca hatcheries. So we made we we developed Chinook, or we we try we try to release more Chinook for for that purpose. Um, but I can tell you that every year. You know, this is a this is a cycle. I can I can explain a little. So the salmon we release it. It goes out for four years out in the water, and then it comes back. Right. So salmon is to me that that staple species, but it's a lie because when it goes out and gets all these nutrients, it brings it back to us. We don't get these nutrients that salmon bring. So fish are what we put in the tank and feed. Okay. And I tell these kids this because I don't want them to see salmon in a fish tank in the future where they're feeding them. 
and talk, and then we're talking about salmon to them, how beautiful and plentiful they used to be in this region. So I remind those kids of that also, this, this, this move, you know, hatcheries, people would say are bad, but again, it's, it's how you look at it and, and what you do with it uh, and where they're at, really. I mean, the state to us, anyways, Bill, Bill will get to that, right? The, uh, the bolt decision, okay, next map, next slide, please. So that, that kind of brings me to some of my story too, because this is, this is my grandfather right here. This is my father. They were part of the, the fish wars. Here's Dorian Sanchez, here's Al Bridges, here's channel seven, 11 and 13, October 13th, 1965. The attention we wanted to bring to what we were doing. And we still do that today. I tell these kids, we still do this protest. Uh, who's, who's the only nation to successfully, successfully protest against this government? These individuals right here. This, 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 uh, the Native Americans are the only ones that have successfully held the protest against the government and changed the course of that. Uh, fish wars started in 60s, bolt decision by 74, but in 78, there was a longest walk that we all, must have been about 15 to 20,000 natives that walked from San Francisco to DC. Uh, uh, my dad was a big part of that. And, and what they were doing is they were bringing, uh, again, information to what our representatives here in the state of Washington were doing to our fishing rights and our water rights and our land rights. They were abrogating our treaty rights and they were trying to do that undercover as, as a session in 78 because uh, Slade Gordon was mad he lost in this war. So they pushed all their representatives at that time to make sure that we didn't have fishing rights anymore. So it was a bigger thing. What, what started here snowballed and got bigger for Indian country, I say. Next slide, please. So today, here's our, here's our usual and a custom map. This is where the Squally, the Squally Ops we claim from the summit to the sea. Here's Mount Rainier, here's Ashford, here's Alby, here's Eatonville, here's McKenna, it goes all the way back down to the mouth. And, and this is our watershed map that we use when we go to meetings and when we talk to people. And, and, and really, a lot of what it, what it comes down to is, is the history, the beautiful history that we talk about, especially in this region up here along the mountain. We got a little brown mark right in the middle here. That's, that's Eatonville. That's the Mayshell. That's a state park. It's going to be 1,000 acres. We have 350 of it, and we're going to tell a story about the massacre that happened there. We call it the Mayshell Massacre. Nobody knows about it. Again, these are some of the events that, that shaped the state of Washington. Okay? So you can imagine everybody coming from the Oregon Territory in the early 1800s, looking for that free land, looking for places to get away from that. And in between, right before Vancouver and Columbia River, all the way up into Canada was still that you know, undaunted frontier, they called it at the time. Um, that, that history there um, has been a long time coming, I tell everybody, um, but it's going to be pretty awesome. It's not something that we're going to, you know, shun everything and, you know, tell this all bad story or whatever, but it's, it's going to talk about the confluence of water and why it's so important. And, and, and that war, what we fought for wasn't just for land, it was for water. It was for water rights because you were going to come in here and suck it all out, I said. And they're starting to do that today. They want to sell the water out of here. They feel the water just runs down the hill like a faucet and somebody just leaves it on. It's a hydrologist who gave that analogy. I go, are we just throwing things out? Because I feel the water gets stuck down in this clay down here in our dirt. You know, the salmon took care of that, but we don't have salmon like we did. We don't have the oysters and the clams like we did that turned that all over for us. And then as you came up here, we turned it all back over with the salmon and the clams and fed, and fed this region. That's why it was so beautiful. And these trees were huge, huge trees. The cedar, and I'm, I don't have my hat on, but I'm a basket weaver. I was taught by my, my, my grandfather. And he was taught by his mom. And she would, she would come up to this mountain right here and gather roots, right? Or maybe, maybe just right in here in Eatonville. Because we always knew that this mountain was sacred. So we never, we never cro crossed the threshold. That's why it's called the Longmire Entrance. That's as far as we went, you know, in those stories. So, and then we tell those stories as it goes up to the mountain, it's sacred. It's, it's you know, it's uh, one of, and when, of course, when people get up there, they, they tell you that, how, how beautiful and serene that area is up there. 
they have this trail around it. They call it the Wonderland Trail. You probably wonder why too, you know, that's one thing I laugh about because that's our trail. We used to walk around the mountain, but they don't, they don't recognize that. It's called Indian Bar and Indian Trail and Indian Henry. And um, so I walked that in 2014 to prove a point. Took these pictures, you know, to show our people that, you know, we need to change the names and the places to what we have. So that, that, that movement's going, it's going pretty good. STI, this curriculum that we've been working with, uh, within the school districts, but also um, with administrators from Mount Rainier. I just, I just held the professional development for them, you know, and I wanted, to, I wanted to teach them that. The same thing, you know, you're educated, but we need to give you the teaching of our people because we seem to forget where it all comes from and why it runs downhill or why the trees grow beautiful and things like that. Do I have another slide on here? I know you guys, <laughs> guys like to listen. These guys like to listen to me talk too. So every time I do these presentations, you know, I, and that's, that's what I tell everybody, you know, I love, um, oh, I forget his name. Uh, uh, first ferry system we had. So these canoes and you see how beautiful they are. You see them holding the pole. We don't have paddles, we pulled the river. So there was this, this technique we had because it wasn't very deep. And he would, he would take people across that uh, lake. We had these lakes in our, in, our, in, our, in our area. People wanted to cross them so that he was our, he was our crosser there. You pay him the coin to get across. But the pole, again, very, very, very similar to a lot of, of I would say trees because this this tree goes straight up in the mountain we call it vine maple you see them sometimes they grow kind of, but there's areas up there in in the mountains where these poles go straight up in the air like they're reaching up and then our our people would cut them down and when we used them we pushed along like that and then we just flip the pole back up pushed along so they and then uh, uh even up here you know our people there was there were in 1919, I remember they, they talk about how, how great our athletes were, but we were always so in the culture that when sports was introduced to us, we were just amazing at it. You know, we have a, I had a cousin, we talk about him, Aaron Kalama, they named part of the school and stadium after him. Um, big tall guy, he, you know, Hawaiian blood, that's Hawaiian blood. I got some of it in me too from my mom's side, but he was 6'2 and he could throw a fastball 97 miles an hour. Just like that, my, my grandpa, my dad said he just whip it down here like that, just like nothing. He had the Dodgers, Pitch, Pittsburgh Pirates, New York Yankees, and there was another scout that would come to the reservation games on the ball field and watch these guys play. Of course, he never made it past 25, got in a car wreck, got killed. Um, that was some of those trees, I tell people too, that on our reservation road, there's a lot of trees, so people always wanna cut the trees down too. Um, but that's what happens. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't go through the trees. We went around our trees in our paths and our walks where we went. Trees are, trees are very sacred because they, they, they intertwine. So this is the, the weaver analogy I used and Willie loves it because I intertwine my knowledge from what I know to what I want to teach. So when I make this basket and I present it, I, that's how I present it. And I've always been taught that about these baskets and when you weave and what you're putting into it, um, it's the same thing about, about our trees and our water. It's connected. Um, this water here along our area, Muck Creek, Nisqually, uh, there's a lot of little, we call them red salmon slough and all these little springs. But Muck Creek is that big one, Muck Creek and Squalitude Creek. So James told me in some of his corresponding letters back to his people, he talked about how raging these rivers were that we had down here um along the along the coast and so you know having having these not only raging rivers but that that um fresh water and that's what that's what we had grandpa willie he lived to be 104 he died in 1983 he was born in 18 so when you think about it uh he always drank from from medicine creek they call it miss springs down there city of olympia took that well from us in 1930 um pretty much just just occupied it and then put this pump house on there uh, and then they did a water test and they were saying like i said the water hydrologist i used to hear all these from some of our natural resource guys but they took dye they used to take little little ducks and put them in the water to see where this spring water came out at so muck creek was one of those tests up there along the prairie on the other side of roy and mckenna and when they put the water in muck creek it came out everywhere down there along the river 
um, out in front of the mouth, out over in Squalitude Creek. And then there was another one over there called Woodland Creek that goes through Lacey. So the water now, it's still, it's still flowing like we see it, or we don't see it under, underground. But what we see on top, it's just minimal of what we see. Um, one more slide, right? And so today, you know, practicing, practicing what we know, as I tell them, you know, it's, uh, it's in our blood. It'll always be in our blood. I know we have less and less salmon. So um, I used to set my calendar for school by the run of our salmon when I was growing up from elementary to middle school. High school, I got into sports and got into girls and forgot about fishing. But um, during that time, you know, because we were always out in the water, July, August, September, October, and November. I remember we used to pay for the Puyallup Fair on the chum run that we'd get coming in, right? We, my dad would make some money and then he'd take us all to the Puyallup Fair on September 20th. And that's why that 21st or 22nd during, during uh, the Puyallup is kind of Native American day. Um, so Jason, Jason Couts here comes from a very predominant family, Nuji Couts, his, uh, I want to say probably uncle, great uncle, huh? Yeah, he's, he's Joe Couts. So. And Nuji was part of the six, we call them the renegades. So there was Nuji Couch, Jack McLeod, uh, Herman, Herman John Sr., uh, Don McLeod Sr., Billy Frank, and Jack McLeod. Those six uh, went to jail, uh, spent you know, months in jail, and then continued to go back like Billy did. He continued to go back. And I always hear these stories because I never, I'm, I'm that generation that just sat and got to listen to it all, right? And just, but now I get to repeat it because they, they, they have a hard time repeating stuff like this. The, the emotion, the anger um, always takes over for my father. But I got to listen to those stories and just like, man, you should be recorded and we should be sharing these stories of, of that adventure, what had happened, you know, and then, um, that starting point of that. Next slide, please. Of course, you guys aren't going to tell me how much, how much time I got left. So this, this must be land of ours today. Um, and I know we always want to, people ask us, well, how much, how much reservation land do you have today? Right? We're, we're just under, of the 14,000 acres right here, we're, we're only on a little portion of that. You see the, see, the, see the little lettering right there. It says Tribal Center. And then a lot of the other land down here is what we bought back. So Nisqually Tribal property out here, down along here. So there was never uh, uh, what we say that, that ancestral you know, reservation land that we have. And if we do go back to it, that's why I said it's Tomey State Park. That's over here in Eatonville along the LaGrand Dam right here where they create that dam. And then up there by Mount Rainier along the Longmire entryway right there was, was a village of ours. If it wasn't there, it was down here because they called him Indian Henry, but he was from Yakima, probably Cowlitz. You know, we have a lot of family that's from that, from that region that, that, that live right outside of, of, of the mountain area, you know, because of how beautiful and how much, how much medicine and how, how much herbs she has. And, and I was always taught it was a female because she gives life, right? So only, only females give life and only males take life. That's how, we, that's how I was taught about, especially hunting when he was teaching me about hunting. But anyway, so the mountain um, and the area of, of the mountain, I would say that's kind of down her valley and in, in, in her way like that is, is, is Nisqually. Well, always be Nisqually, I say. Uh, next slide. Canoe journey. So tribal journeys, you know, we call the tribal journeys. We call the canoe journeys. Uh, we haven't had it in probably three years. I hope Muckleshoot hosts something next year. But tribal journeys was a space where we could practice that protocol. Like that, that authentic, traditional protocol, getting up and, and speaking who you are and your family and singing these songs that were handed down for generations. Um, there isn't really a platform for that. We have our, we have our ceremonies in the wintertime. So those songs and those, those practices are always going to be kind of that hush, hush, quiet that never really get kind of shared. But then Journeys created the better platform of that. Because we did, we traveled up and down this coast. We went up here to Seattle, up to Tulela, uh, even into Canada, you know, with our canoes. So bringing it back, just, just help reassure our kids in the future about this, this tradition. 
and um uh and and in our heritage really i mean this is this is who we are you know we want our kids to to carry that forth that way also who we are um and, and we'll always be here so they you know they they get in there we make this regalia they they put a lot of you know their time into it they do their own you know they come up with their own ideas although we've been using the mountain theme so the Colma, and when 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 grandpa talks about it uh, they just did a video. I wish we had that video. I don't think we have it, do we? I just showed it to the national park group. It was it was awesome, but it's in our language, so you can't understand it. And that's and that's pretty awesome because that's our first language, and that's how we want it to be presented in our language first. Because English wasn't our first language, so we're putting that forth in that and this next group of of educated kids that we have. We got what six language teachers in this program we just started. Um, and I know a lot of tribes are picking up that language program, but ours is going to be inserted into these schools with these gentlemen who are helping us with that, uh, making it a credit. Uh, and, uh, and also this journey, you know, where we, we have these career to path, pathway to careers or uh, generating, you know, they needed some credits or something, you know, I know uh, it's a, it's a, it's working. I, th I believe it started. And I know Lushai, the school chief Lushai, um, they have a pretty good one. I sent my son there uh, for his senior year this year. Um, uh, and he loved it, right? He was, he was a credit down in the public schools, maybe a credit and a half, but he went through the cooking program and he went through some other carving programs, um, and was able to retrieve those credits, which was pretty awesome to see that. So is there one more slide? I always say that so I could pass this on to, oh, I love this one here. We, uh, took a group of kids down into the capital. Again, I think it was, had to, had to, had to, um, tie together with our, um, What's that dam up there that we want to get removed on Fourth Ave along that bridge? It was a it was a Squaxin protest and bring attention to um, the drowning of that of that wetland out there. That when they built the Capitol, they puddled up the chutes so they could make a a beautiful lake so they could see the reflection off the lake. So I think it's time to change the reflection, <laughs> change it back to the original scene, you know, that was there. But um, yeah, is that it? I'm done. Yes, thank you. Oh yeah, Uncle Ruben, Uncle Rube. Yeah, Uncle Rube, no, I mean, this is our salmon ceremony we do down by the river every every July or August, uh, although we last Uncle Rube a couple of years ago. So it's 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 still going, you know, but slowly, you know, we're, we just harvested our salmon uh, for the last couple, couple openings, but um, uh, a very slow season this year. Uh, we're projected uh, to be even slower as as the runs come down between the coho and the chum uh in in november and december so thank you yeah so uh so listening to handprint obviously is is great um and i love this format today having two hours worth because we can really really listen to hanford normally when we do this uh we know not to give the, the microphone to Hanford first. <laughs> you might not get it back. You only got 40 minutes. So no, Hanford's great to listen to. So I'm glad we were taking the time to listen to everything he uh, uh, has put forth. A lot of knowledge there. Uh, I learn something new every time uh, I listen to him talk. Uh, something new comes out to me or, oh, I didn't know that or I didn't realize that. Um, so uh yeah stephanie's pulling up the treaty if you could can you just blow it up a little enlarge the print for those of us who have reached a certain age <laughs> so uh my job is to talk about the treaty right and so we're going to break down the treaty um and and talk about its value to us uh as native people it's what establishes us as a sovereign nation uh it's more unique in that regard um that we can do this and our treaties we hold as an equal document to the constitution for us there's no differentiation we don't have we don't hold one higher than the other those are equal documents to us they're that valuable to us as native people um these treaties as westward expansion came out the u.s u.s government was more uh they got they got wiser on how to do these things right how to negotiate treaties um and um rather than just being at war and killing a bunch of people uh which happened historically uh, in the united states 
um, and having your own uh, soldiers getting killed in the process, they learn to negotiate and sit down with tribal leaders. Um, you know, there was that authoritarian view. Obviously, we have the army and we could wipe you out if we wanted to. Um, or you can sit down and negotiate on a treaty. So a lot of these treaties were signed under duress, right? Like what else, what was the alternative for us to continue fighting until we get wiped out? Or did our ancestors want to leave us something, leave us uh, uh, um, crumbs along the trail for maybe we could survive as Indian people? That's, that's what our ancestors were up against. Do we fight till the, till the end? where we all die, or do we try to get a little something and give our people a chance to live? And that's what our ancestors chose uh, through these treaties. So the treaty we're talking about today uh, is the Treaty of Medicine Creek, 1854. Um, so there's treaties all over the United States, 570 something federally recognized tribes. Most of those are established through treaties. Um, some are an act of Congress. Um, some, some tribes that we, as we've talked about on the state board before are seeking federal recognition, um, haven't got it yet, but are working towards that. Um, so there's lots of treaties, 29 federally recognized tribes in the state of Washington. I say this a lot. We are fortunate, uh, as citizens of the United or of Washington state to have access to tribal people. You go to certain states across the United States, you don't bump into a native person anywhere, not even at Walmart. And we love us some Walmart as, native, as Indian people. You ain't gonna see an Indian because they're not in that state. There's not, they're not physically present there anymore. In our state, we have access to 29 federally recognized tribes and we've just overlooked it, right? Especially in education, especially in education, right? The system was not set up for native students, right? If the system were set up for native students, they'd be doing really well. Right. So it wasn't set up for us uh, and we've missed out. It's a missed opportunity, I think, through school. So that's what we're working on um, to help to help elevate our entire system. So the Treaty of Medicine Creek uh, in 1854, if you scroll down a little bit, Stephanie, I appreciate it. Right there, right there is good. Um, actually, come down a little to the top. I want to point out up. Sorry. up. Sorry. I can get my directions. I just want to list the the the. Uh, the tribes here that are lumped in. So there's Nisqually, Puyallup. Oh, could you go back down a little? Yep, Nisqually, Puyallup, Stillicum, uh, Squaxin, uh, Sohamish, Stichas, Topeakson. So those are all the villages uh, from Squaxin. Muckleshoot is also under this treaty. Uh, so the Stillicum tribe, a lot of those people are now enrolled through Puyallup. Uh, there are Stillicum tribal members. Their enrollment card says Puyallup because they got lumped in under this treaty. So you had a lot of that happen. Where you, and even in Nisqually, Hanford said and had maps out of just multiple villages all along the way. Well, there wasn't one Nisqually people. I mean, I, you know, I suppose there were, but there were multiple villages, and you came from different locations, multiple areas. You pull all those people together. You put them under one treaty. Um, and it's a land grab. You get more land that way. You don't have to negotiate all these separate treaties, take more time to do it. Um, you pull them all together. Uh, my tribe in Nia Bay, the Macaw tribe, we have five villages uh, under the Treaty, Ma Treaty of Macaw. So five villages, pull them all together, one treaty, out the door, locked and done. We get all your land, okay? Um, so if we read, <clears throat> let's scroll down to article, or up to article one. Let's frame that in there nice, thank you. So Article 1, this is the language of the treaty, and we talk about how important language is uh, it, it, to us as Native people, all right? And so Article 1 reads, the said tribes and bands of Indians hereby cede, relinquish, and convey to the United States all their right, title, and interest in, and to the lands and country occupied by them, bounded and described as follows. And then it goes on to point out the land, right? Here's all the land that the federal government wants, right? This is what this treaty is about. We're gonna take all of this land if you sign this treaty. And we'll reserve some things for you. Uh, that's what the negotiation was. What, do we, what can we reserve for us in exchange for, for all of this land, okay? Excuse me. So when you read it like that, especially in academia, right? You just read to get through it get through the document, get to the end, you have an understanding of the document and you move on. So when you read it like that, it's, it's very matter of fact and you can just kind of cruise by 
uh, you know, read the uh, the land and where where it is. Then you go down to Article Two and you read Article Two. Then you go on to Article Three. That's kind of how academia works, right? It's very linear. But to us, the use of language is very important. So if you could uh, go back up to Article One, awesome. Okay, so us. The language is very important and the words are very important. They carry a lot of weight. And so uh, I use this example when I give this presentation that my father is a preacher, right? So I come from a family of preachers, a line of preachers. I have three uncles that are, that are preachers. My dad's a preacher. Uh, and I'm not trying to convert anybody here today. <laughs> I'm not proselytizing. I'm just using my father and how he speaks as a preacher as an example uh, of the value of language. And so <clears throat> my father speaks... He gives a sermon about giving your heart to the Lord. Um, it's, you know, conversion, basically, uh, becoming a Christian. You give your, give your heart to the Lord. And when you do that, you ask for forgiveness, and God will forgive you of all of your sin. And then my dad would say, God will forgive you of all, all of your sin, all of it. Everything you've ever done that's bad, every bad thought every bad action, God will forgive it all, no matter what you've done, drug addiction, alcoholism, you know, bad things that you've done, God will forgive you of all of that, all of it. So <clears throat> if you read this like a preacher, or as a native person, an indigenous perspective, here's how it reads. The said tribes and bands of Indians hereby seed, relinquish, and convey to the United States all, all, all their right and title, all of it, everything you've ever had, gone, all of it. That's how it reads to us. We lost everything, everything. The Nisqually people gave up everything they ever had. Imagine that. We lost, Hanford had the map up of, the, of where Nisqually resided from Mount Rainier, right? The Nisqually Glacier, all those areas and prairies, beautiful, gorgeous land, right? And what else is on those lands? Natural resources, right? Everything that you just gave up on that land, everything, cedar trees, water rights, mineral rights. What if there was gold found? You just gave it up. What if later on you discovered oil? You just gave it up. Everything you've ever known, sacred sites where people were married, where we buried people, where you went to hunt, where our women went to give birth to their children, gone. You don't ever, 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 ever have that no more. It's just gone now, okay? So that's how it reads. One tiny little word. Said tribes and bands of Indians hereby seed, relinquishing convey to the United States, all three tiny little letters, huge implications for native people all across America and for the Nisqually people. One tiny little word, all, right? So when you read it like that, that's an indigenous perspective. That's how it reads. We just gave up everything. But if you scroll down to article two, here's the brilliance of our ancestors. And I use that word intentionally. They were brilliant, brilliant people, right? The longer we go on in time, the more we study, the more we understand the brilliance of indigenous people all across the world. Okay, so the brilliance of our ancestors is in article number two. There is, however, reserved for the present use and occupation of the said tribes and bands the following tracts of land, uh, and then it describes the map where you live now, which Hanford had up. So you see the, the land property, the footprint of where the tribe exists today. Then later on, the federal government came in, condemned two thirds of it, and took it back. Right, so that's a whole other story. We're not going to get to that today. <laughs> that's a that's another day. So um, there is, however, reserved for the present use and occupation of the said tribes and bands of the following tracts of land. So they reserved our land. So the word that we like to use uh, in this portion of the presentation is that one word, reserved. Right, that's where the word reservation comes from. That's why tribal people live on a reservation. That land was reserved. We reserved that land in exchange for hundreds of thousands of acres of land and all the natural resources that existed on those lands. So that's the brilliance of our ancestors. If we scroll down to Article 3, 
this brilliance continues, right? Article three reads, the right of taking fish at all usual and accustomed grounds and stations is further secured to said Indians in common with all the citizens of the territory and of erecting temporary houses for purposes of curing blah, 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 right? Together with the privilege of hunting, gathering roots and berries, pasturing their horses and open and unclaimed lands. Okay, so that's the brilliance. So the word reserve is not in Article 3. It's already been referred to in Article 2, right? So we've also reserved the right of taking fish. And so it's important that we get that word across to, to people as we reserve those rights. Nobody gave us anything, right? You'll hear that a lot. Tribal people, you get this and you don't have to pay tax and you get health care and you get housing. No, no one gave us that. Right. Your local municipality didn't give it to the tribe. Right. Counties don't provide anything to the tribe. The state government doesn't provide anything. The federal government doesn't give us anything. We reserve those rights in exchange for hundreds of thousands of acres of land and all the natural resources that existed on those lands. So that's the one word, one of the key words we want to get across in this presentation. And that's the brilliance of our ancestors. They knew that the right of taking fish at all usual and custom grounds is a survival tactic. We're gonna need that to live and survive as human beings. If we don't have salmon, we're probably not gonna make it, right? And even today, we know that salmon, especially our wild native salmon, are a keystone species, right? If you're talking about science and ecology, they're a keystone species, meaning you can measure the health of other animals directly by understanding the data and the health of the salmon. We also know how healthy human beings are going to be by measuring the health of salmon. So if salmon runs are depleted, if they're getting smaller, if they're in polluted rivers and waters and they're diminishing in population, guess what folks? We are not far behind as humans. It's a measuring stick. However salmon live and exist in our world, we're not far behind in our own health. Right, So that's the protection for us of salmon is not just the fish. I mean, yes, it is that, but it's all those things that come with it, right? Climate change, stream temperature, how clean the stream is. Is there enough water in the stream for salmon to spawn and smolt to grow and to get back out? Is the, um, the dikes down at the wildlife refuge, is that damaging to salmon runs? Yes, so that's why when, uh, the tribe kind of got help, we removed those because the general overall health of the sea is important to the health of salmon, which is important to the health of us as humans, okay? So the language again is very important. So um, I like to tell a little joke right here. Uh, the right of taking fish at all usual and accustomed grounds is where we have always done that, right? Where we have always done that. So. The joke is I would like to get a espresso stand, <laughs> put it on the reservation. I would name it usual and accustomed grounds. So we could go get a cup of coffee at UNA. So that's my one little joke. <laughs> okay, but the language is very important. Usual and accustomed grounds means where we have always done that, right? And that's the language that kind of led to the fish wars, right? So we had native peoples and the Squally people on the river fishing, we were fishing, they were fishing in their usual accustomed grounds, but not within the border that someone imposed upon us. Does that make sense? So we fished where we have always fished, like it says we can in the treaty, right? Usual accustomed stations is further secured to said Indians in common with all citizens of the territory. Now. This language is partly what we used, our legal team and our legal strategy used in US v. Washington or the Bolt decision. It's more properly known as the Bolt decision. It's the 50 year anniversary of Bolt decision this year, correct? I think so, 2024, so next year. Um, so we're coming up on 50 year anniversary of that decision, which gave tribal people in the state of Washington the right to 50% of the take of salmon annually. And the more important thing it did was it made us co-managers along with the state. In other words, the state didn't have authority over tribes anymore to say you can or can't do A, B, C, or D. 
Now we're partners, we're 50-50, okay? And again, the language is very important. So how do we get to the number of 50%, right? Well, our attorneys argued that it says right here in Article 3 of this treaty signed by the federal government, signed by us, we both agree to this, right? And when you talk to kids, when we do this presentation to kids, you talk about a contract, right? Kids understand that, right? Here's the things that I, as a teacher, am going to do. Here's the things you as a student are going to do. We agree on these. I sign it. You sign it. Therefore, we got to follow through on each other, right? Kids get that. That's just, this is what the same thing is, right? You, you said you were going to take all this land. We said, okay, we want to reserve these things. So that's all we're doing, okay? Uh, further security state Indians in common. So that language, that phrase, those two words in common is what our legal team used to argue the number of 50%. So if you're talking about the phrase in common, you know, you break that down to one word, what does that mean? Well, it means equal. If you convert the word equal numerically, it's 50%. We get half. So that's where that number came from, okay, during the Bolt decision. And that's what our legal team argued. Now, the Bolt decision happened. Uh, Judge Bolt was probably at the time the worst judge we could have drawn to oversee the case. Uh, he had a history of ruling against tribal issues prior to that. Uh, he was a very conservative judge, um, was appointed by Eisenhower. Um, a lot of his decision making were against tribal people up to that point. And when we drew his name, well, I say we, I wasn't there. <laughs> I was like six months old. When we drew his name, we were like, oh, we already knew. We knew the outcome just by the judge. We knew what was going to happen. You know, we were going to, you know, be shoved to the side and marginalized and ignored once again. As Indian people, we're used to that, right? So it's going to happen again. However, in Judge Bolt's defense, Judge Bolt did what any good judge, whatever side of the aisle, whoever appointed you or not, doesn't matter, what any good judge should do, and he followed the rule of law. In this case, he did that. He said, yes, there it is. The right of taking fish at all usual and custom grounds is further secured, right? And so in common with all citizens of the United States. And he upheld that. And we were like, what? Like he ruled in our favor? Like that had never happened before. It was shocking, right? He was the worst judge we could have drawn. And yet we got the decision because he did the right thing. He followed the rule of law, okay? Um, so the number 50%, again, more importantly, made us co-managers of the species. Right, And so now tribes negotiate with the state, where they work with ecology, work with fish and wildlife, you know, natural resources, forestry, all of that stuff. They all work together uh, to maintain the health and, and, and um, ecology of salmon so that they can survive. But it's still a fight, right? It's still a fight for us as tribal people. We still have to continue to fight for salmon today. We cannot ever give up because if we do, it's good, we're harming ourselves. And we're not doing right by our ancestors who left us this with their brilliance. We have to carry that work on. And we have to protect water. Tacoma, don't forget the water, right? We all need human beings as water. And there's not a soul in here that can exist in any form and healthy way without water. We need that. It's an important reset, resource, right? And don't forget, I think we live in Washington State. There's beautiful water everywhere. It rains here all the time. Water is a finite resource. Finite resource. It could come to an end one day where we don't have access to it. You see that in other parts in our country. In other parts of the world, people don't have access to water anymore. And they're struggling. Right? That could happen here. Every drop of rain that happens is already spoken for in the state of Washington. You talk about water rights right? Water, not, not, not only water quality, like how clean it is, but water quantity, who gets what? It's already spoken for. You've got private landowners, you've got state organizations that need it, you've got fishery department that needs it, you've got ranchers in eastern Washington, we're a huge agricultural state, all the snowpack, 
that's that's a water source. That's a water body. That's what feeds our farmers. It's very important to farmers. It's very important to us. You know, I like Yakima corn. <laughs> I like me some reindeer cherries, right? All that beautiful produce that happens over there. That's because that water is already spoken for. It's already doled out, right? So when we fight for salmon, we're not just fighting for salmon. We're also fighting for water because we know as humans, we need that um, to continue to have a good life. Um, okay. <clears throat> And so I, I think that kind of leads me to, this is normally where I'd hand it off to Willie, right? And we talk about the fish wars. And so um, Billy Frank Jr. was arrested over 50 times. I want to say like 54, though I might get the number messed up, but over 50 times for fishing because this language, usual and accustomed grounds is clear in the treaty. And it's clear to us where we have always done that for thousands and thousands of years. That's where we're normally going to fish. But to recreational fishers, they didn't interpret it that way. They said, you got to fish on your reservation. And at the time, there was no RCWs. There was no wax around where you could or could not fish, right? So to us, we were fishing in our usual and accustomed grounds. That's the promise. Outsiders were saying, no, you shouldn't fish. You should only fish on your reservation. And so that's what the argument was with fish and wildlife and game wardens at the time. And that's where they rescued. There was no state law. The state law that existed meant if you were fishing off the reservation off season, which there wasn't an off season to us, we, we knew when the season was, right? If you were fishing off season off the reservation, you would get arrested because at the time that was state law. They were following the law. But it wasn't like, you know, oh, please, sir, come with me. We're going to go this way. And, you know, I, I apologize when I have to place you under arrest. No, it was beatings. It was thuggery. It was clear out and out racism. Not only would they get arrested, they'd get beaten up and then arrested, face in the mud, bloody noses, you name it. Batons, well, the real deal, they weren't just, you know, please get in the back of the car, sir. No, it wasn't like that at all, right? So over 50 times, Billy Frank Jr. and all these others, the other six got arrested and thrown in jail. That's embarrassing. It's embarrassing in our state even during that time, the racism that, that existed, it's embarrassing that we allowed that to happen somehow. Throwing someone in jail for fishing, for fishing. You said right there, we could do this. And now you're gonna take it away from us. Not only take it away, but put me in jail. It was an embarrassing time. And we all knew as native people, we knew we were right, but you also have to play the system. Right, you have to go through the courts, you have to hire a legal team, but we did that, and so we got those rights. And so, at the time, that's what the fish wars was about. And when we won, it was like, Oh, thank god, we won this decision because it wasn't a greedy celebration, meaning we can continue to fish and make money and feed our families and pay our bills, but it was we knew. With 50% of the take of salmon, we knew we could conserve now. We can conserve our 50%. Other people thought we were just going to wipe it out. We were going to fish right up to that number, 50%, wipe the fish out. There's no evidence of that. We're indigenous people, we know about the cycle of life. We know you can't take every salmon. Why? Because they don't come back the next year. However, many, you got to let them go upstream and they got to spawn and you got to go to healthy places. Like, why would we fish our 50%? That doesn't make any sense. We got to fish what we need to to survive, conserve the rest, and then try to help you figure out how you can conserve that 50%, right? It's like Jerry Maguire, help me help you. Like, we're trying to help you with this. And so that's why the partnership in this and the fish wars was so important. Um, so that kind of wraps up my portion. Do we? Yeah. Oh. Ready? Okay, hand it off to Mike. All right, thank you. Keep on going back to our, our presentation. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Go ahead, next slide there. For, for our state, yeah, you can find all the treaties. Um, that our state has on the Goya website. 
And then other other states, you probably just go to the site. Most sites have their own website now. So if you want to research like Nezpers in Idaho, you probably pull up their treaty and see what that is. You know, with other tribes in Oklahoma, you could probably pull up their treaty and see what they read like. Um, one thing I forgot to add is uh, the importance of the Bolt decision as it relates to the Macaw tribe, my tribe specifically, is because our treaty, treaty of Macaw, we're the only tribe in the lower 48 that has a specific right to hunt whales in our treaty. Right? We were known whale hunters, everybody knew that. So the language of the right of taking fish, shellfish, uh, usual hunting grounds, we also include whales, taking whales. And that's why when we fought to get our whale in 99, uh, when we fought for the right and it was finally granted at the federal level, we used in our legal defense and our legal argument, the Bolt decision, right? Because established law was upheld by Judge Bolt that we get the right. And that was all based off the language of the treaty. So clearly in our treaty, it says we have the right to hunt whales. So we knew all along that we were going to be granted the right because of the Bolt decision, right? Had not been for the Bolt decision, we probably never would have had the right to been denied somehow, way, shape, or form to hunt whales. And even I can make the argument, which we do with our team, that we may not be doing this today if not for the Bolt decision. If you think about it and rewind, if we weren't respected at that level when, way back then, this type of interaction as a governmental high policy, you know, state board of education might not have ever happened, right? But now because of the Bolt decision, we move forward and we're doing all this stuff, we're able to do this because in part by, uh, you know, following the Bolt decision and, and how that had an impact on other places. So. Should I use the Native Land Act, the Native Act for the treaty? Is that accurate? Do you know? I don't, I'm not familiar with that app. So I have the native app and it just, it like it shows like right now where I'm on this side, this land is one of the treaties, but right now where I am, and I've used it for a while, but I never know I, I've talked to a lot of friends, uh, Indian friends, like, is it accurate, like, to the best of my knowledge, but I don't know if it's accurate by location or, you know, if it's pretty good. I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. The native land's up to you. The native yeah. app. So, um, even like if you're on the website, it will uh, inform you that it, it's ongoing progress. I think the important thing to remember is just the proclamation because, you know, as, as, as Hanford kind of explained too, that um, we were always moving, right? So there's sort of like this Western conception that we were, we were set in there. Like you would have your, your, your summer villages and your winter villages. Um, and so generally the best that you can do to kind of get a sense of and you are it's sort of a general approximation um but that can also change throughout time because you can even see like during like the history of the reservation boundaries um even in recent memory that the squally were being moved around space to space oh, on the, well I'll let it i'm done now <laughs> <laughs> yeah good across our state are they you know so like where i live over in spokane you know spokane tribe and um kalispell carlane paulville well carlane obviously is a little different but are, are they similar and are they all pretty yeah. aligned where they have those yeah rights think, reserved yeah most trees by the time they got out this way was more this more the place legal documents that they could see um you might you might see variations like macaw i mean we're the only ones that have whale that reserve that right. We're the only ones that hunt whale. Um, I think for these tribe has some issues too, but they didn't have that reserved in their inside of their treaty. Um, so yeah, but most treaties read, you know, pretty much like what you saw, uh, even in even in other states. But the variation is the geography, right? Like land, how much land is taken, those types of things. But so the reservation and the language around the treaty or the right to keep up with the law. Um, when you were talking about language in Article Three, one of the the question I had because the word that stuck out to me twice in there was the word citizens, because at that point, uh, Native Americans weren't considered citizens, and so the question running through my head was if the Bolt decision had happened prior to 1974, since uh, Native Americans weren't considered U.S. citizens until the 1960s. How would that have then been interpreted? I mean, it was fascinating to me looking at that because clearly there was a distinction in there who were citizens right. in Article Three and we who were, were not. Yeah. 
And then now by that 1974, citizenship had been quote unquote granted to Native Americans by the US government. And it, so in my head, I was just thinking, wow, what would have happened with yeah. the legal arguments if that had, I mean, it's just, it's a fascinating thing. Yeah, I, I believe the legal might answer, but I still wouldn't prefer to be my question. So I'll, I'll have you guys later. I'll, I'll transition. Okay. Yeah. So, so we're going to talk a little bit of a little bit more about the heavy stuff, right? So, um, I'm non-native, uh, but my expertise is in development of government-to-government -government, uh, relationships with native tribes, and that is what my doctoral thesis is in, and that's what my continued uh, studies in education is in. And um, something to also remember, inside of these treaties, there's also provisions for boarding schools, right? And this is kind of the heavy topic, and we all know of the news that we've heard from California, or not from California, from uh, Canada, about the things and the atrocities happening in boarding schools. These are the same companies that came to Washington. Right. They aren't different people. They weren't doing different practices. Right. The last boarding school closed in the mid 70s in the United States. Aunties, uncles, grandmas, grandpas, they were in boarding schools. Right. So when you think about the fishing wars and you think about the beatings that happened by the hands of the states, you think about the boarding schools and how boarding schools cut through reservation lands. They didn't they didn't care about reservation borders. They took kids and removed them from their families. You know, Billy Frank Jr. talks a little bit about that in his book, um, Where the Salmon Run, where they stole children and those children never came back, right? So when we start transitioning, and we're going to transition here in a minute about why government to government work is so important, it's about reestablishing trust and relationships. There has been a lot done that none of us were responsible for, right? But that lasting impact uh, still continues to shape the shape the success for our native students in public schools right so uh, in 1921 there was a gentleman by the name of miriam who wrote a report that stated to best educate native students they should probably be educated by their native peoples right about their native knowledges that should probably be incorporated into their into their education nothing changed in 1954 kennedy put out a second report that said the same 69 sorry that said the same thing but nothing changed Right. So these are federal reports by non-native people saying that the best way to educate native youth, as I'm hearing from native people, is to incorporate traditional learnings, incorporate traditional ways of being into your education system, because that's the way that we are going to fully educate our children. So as I handed off to um, Representative Lakanoff, we're going to we're going to really start talking about what does government to government really mean? And how does that work? And these are just a series of questions that we need to reflect upon is as we go into these, what does this mean for our communities, right? Every tribe is different. Every tribe, there's federally recognized tribes and non-federally recognized tribes. There's treaty tribes and non-treaty tribes, right? And every single tribe in our state and across our nation are independent sovereign nations, right? That have different rights and the right to self-determination. Right. So and one thing that we have not done very well as an education system is honor those rights or even ask about those rights or learn about those rights. So when we go into talking about government to government relationships, it really is understanding what sovereignty is and self-determination. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Representative Lekanoff. So I'll have um, they'll pull up a PowerPoint here. So I um, one of the unique um, facts that I get to share with you is um, currently I'm coming into my third term uh, serving the state legislature. I uh, ran against five white males in the in this district and one Republican, five Democrats, one white male, all all six white men. Um, I was told when I was running. Uh, by my Democrats and my Republicans and racism is alive and well, is you cannot be native and you cannot be an American. You have to choose if you're gonna serve in the state legislature. You're a woman, you should take care of your children and stay at home. This is in 2018. Um, just because you work for a tribal government, it's not a real government. When are you guys going to assimilate? Didn't you walk away from everything you gave up to be part of us? Racism was alive and well in 2018. What we do as Native American people and the people of colors who rise above it, 
That was how I was taught in my community. You rise above it, you sit down and you say, how can I help you understand who being a Native American is because I can't be one or the other, I'm both. Um, it's been a unique experience serving the state legislature. I ran unopposed last year, our last session. I ran unopposed this session and I'm hoping that I'm doing something right. And I hope that I'm be going to be able to serve my community, my constituents, and to be able to help them understand how can we do better as governing bodies? How can I be a state legislator and help bring tribal, local, state, federal, and international governments together? How do I help listen and educate my constituents? How do I help nonprofit organizations, for-profit, for-profit, for-profit organizations? How do I do something better? And I'm hoping by running two terms on a pose that I'm bringing hope that I'm bringing integrity and that I'm building collaboration because without that, not just one government is going to save our communities, provide a safe place for our children, provide sound education. And with that, I'm able to bring to the state legislature almost 30 years of experience on government, government relationship. At 21, I was the youngest to be elected on my tribal government and my tribal board. I was still going to college at Central Washington University and we, we didn't have Zoom back then, right? That's how old I was. I was still calling in and dialing in to my tribal community of 300 when helping govern my community. In the early ages of 30, I was elected to my tribal corporation. Uh, for six years, I served as the chair of my tribal corporation while I served Chairman Brian Clattisby, who was one of the longest chairmen serving in Washington state and was the president of National Congress of American Indians. So you can tell I was kind of busy. It's kind of busy dealing with world politics underneath the famous, amazing, and we miss him so much, Obama administration. At one time, one time, Bill, we're standing at the National uh, White House Summit, and Obama was quite close with Chairman Clattisby from Swinomish, uh, old golfers, basketball players, et cetera. He goes, so Obama leans down to Obama, and or Obama leans down to, to Chairman Clattisby, he goes, so Brian, what are we going to do in the next golf match and if I win, can Deborah come work with me in the White House? <laughs> and if I lose, and Brian's like, no, 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 we're not giving Deborah away. She's staying, doing, she's staying and working in Indian country. I, I share this because there's so much that I've got to, I got to learn working underneath 29 federally recognized tribes of Washington State, 57 tribes underneath AT&I, 566 tribes at that point uh, across the United States, 577. Um, I, uh, I am the only Native American to serve in the state legislature. I had the pleasure of learning from Senator John McCoy, who took me underneath his wings, and Senator Claudia Kaufman. Uh, to be the only person sitting in the entire state legislature where no one looks like you, no one laughs like you, no one gets your jokes, no one understands your justification, no one understands why a person of color and a Native American needs these rights and understands these rights. In closed doors, it's an interesting situation on how you're being treated. Worst of all, no one laughs like me and no one gets my jokes. And I, I, uh, it's quite lonely. It's a lonely place, but it builds me, it builds strength, it builds character. I was sworn in in uh, 2019 wearing my grandma's regalia. Uh, there were 70 tribal members. Uh, there were almost all 20 tribes. There were 50 drums on the floor of the people's house and language from First Nations and Washington tribes that the floor had never heard before in the state legislature. I was sworn in by Ron White, who was a Squaxin judge, never done before. I share this with you because there's hope that we can do this. And all the work you guys are gonna do, if I work so hard to get there, you guys are gonna get there. Government to government is really going to be where my uh, legacy, I hope, lands in the state legislature. The bills that we talked about, Chair, thank you for giving me the bills that introduced the work that we're doing today. I'm part of that implementation of 1426. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm becoming a politician. I'm remembering <laughs> House bill numbers. The Native mascot bill was my bill. Um, really meant a lot to me. Um, uh, the implementation of the sovereign curriculum, the um, since time and memorial curriculum was part of the work I did as a governmental services, but it's gonna improve this year. Bill. We're going to build the capacity in that office. We're going to put money in it. We're going to put a deadline in it. We're going to help get it implemented. So we've got a plan. 
I always have a plan. Um, next slide. One, I'm gonna go through three different topics real quick. Uh, one, let's talk about land acknowledgement. Um, thank you for doing and leading the way on how to do land acknowledgement properly coming out of the Nisqually tribe and the work that you guys done because many are still struggling. In fact, there was a huge uh, rally during Roe versus Wade on the steps of Olympia and they were trying to do a land acknowledgement bill and they, they honored Stiligwamish as it was the ancestral lands of the Stiligwamish tribe. Stiligwamish is located up here on the Stilaguam or, uh, 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 Stilaguamish River. You gotta get it right, you gotta get it right. Um, when we talk about land, land is part of who we are. It's a mixture of our blood, our past, our current and our future. We can carry our ancestors in us and they're around us as you all do. Uh, there was an assessment that's been done by um, the universities and by NARF. It helps you understand when you're doing a land acknowledgement, um, take the time to really understand, and this is advice going down to your school districts, whose land you're on. Because you're right, you're trying to figure out whose land are we on. I think uh, in a unique situation, what I understood from tribal leaders is if Jared comes on the Nisqually homelands, he's gonna thank the Nisqualis for being on the native homeland. Today, we are on the homelands of the Samish people. However, the Samish people is part of the Poinelia Treaty, which is also part of four other tribes, which is sister underneath uh, the umbrella of the Swinomish tribe. So proper land acknowledgement, understanding you're on the homelands of the Samish people, but you're also underneath the homelands of many tribes who have called this place home and harvested from these lands. So it's really gentle, be really delicate, be very thoughtful when you're working about land acknowledgements. Um, there's no single consensus on how to summary refer to the diverse com communities that live on lands whose boundaries and borders do not necessarily follow those on colonization. So remember, Native Americans were nomads. We traveled here and there. Where we lived and where we laid our head was where we harvested and where we fished. We had summer camps, berry camps. Nisqually had huckleberry camp. We had salmon camp, we had deer camp, we had cedar camp. Uh, we didn't go and live up in the mountains during the winter time and we're hunting deer, that wasn't home, we followed. So when we say these are the homelands of, we acknowledge that. Uh, we acknowledge that they were um, coming and moving through these areas. Next slide. Um, just a little bit of background of why we did land acknowledgement. Um, you know, it started up in Canada. Uh, this isn't something that originated down here in the lower 48. Um, it has been performed since the 1970s. It became more common in the 2000s. Uh, and the, it is important as a refutation of the colonial fiction of Terra Nullis, which was overturned by the Mabo decision in 1992. Take a look at that just a little bit. That's good to know the background because if you're ever asked by a school district, I'm trying to incorporate how to do land acknowledgement. You can take my slides and my information and send it to them and they can work with their own school boards and et cetera. Do natives want land acknowledgement? Some do, some don't. Um, Nisqually did it the right way. Uh, how we do land acknowledgement up in the North End in my district, it's very delicate. Uh, they still haven't come up with a consensus of how to do it. I still have Samish and Swinomish fighting over land up here. I still have tribes fighting over fishing rights. Uh, the advice I got from Chairman Leonard Forsman from Suquamish was, because um, he's fighting for fishing rights right now, land acknowledgement, et cetera, in different areas, fishing and harvesting. It's a really big part of fishing rights, treaty rights, hunting rights, gathering rights. He goes, in Seattle, when he goes to do a land acknowledgement, because he is having a difficult, interesting conversation between the Duwamish who is not recognized and Suquamish who is recognized, is the chairman does something very politically correct. He says, this is the land where the ancestors have walked on. Many ancestors have lived here, died here, and are buried here. They took care of this place, so we may all call this place home. You will not hear the chairman of Suquamish call Seattle their ancestral homelands in downtown Seattle, because at the same time, he'll have Muckleshoot coming up to chat with him too, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's politics. Next slide, please. Um, if we're going to do land acknowledgement, just a couple tips. Start with the self-reflection. Before starting to work on your land acknowledgement, uh, land acknowledgement statement, reflect on the, on the process. You know, why am I doing this? Am I doing it to make me feel good? 
or am I doing it to make them feel good? You know, this isn't about you, it's about them. Um, what is your end goal? Do you hope listeners will do after hearing the land acknowledgement? I was at the Sailor Sea Ecosystem Conference given a presentation to 700 scientists, policy and people. The best way I could get them to do a land acknowledgement at that time is I said, we all love the Sailor Sea and we all love the ancestors who call this place home so we may all call it home. To have 750 people doing a land acknowledgement in that way was great. Then I sent the proposal to Starbucks and I wanted to see whether or not they put it on the coffee cup. I'm still waiting. Um, and then just uh, do a little bit of homework. Um, you know, take a look at who the land belongs to. You can go to the websites that you guys were talking about in Washington State, Goya, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Will, but I trust Goya's facts all the time and they keep it up to date. Every time Goya, uh, Government of Indian Affairs, um, when you find the information on there, uh, uh, Craig Bill is the director, he keeps it updated. Court cases change all the time and they change where your lines and your borders, where you fish and you harvest are. So we'll be careful with that. Next slide, please. A um, Couple more tips. Uh, indigenous place names and language. Uh, this is really important. I carry the last name Lakanoff. I don't know how many people don't know how to say Lakanoff. Uh, many people don't know how to say Swinomish, Piala, Suquamish, Waka, Nooksack, Quilute, Quits, uh, Ho, um, Kreets, <laughs> Kalapala. Um, we, uh, it's very good. Take the time to get to know the names. It's really, it really means something. And it's very important, especially if you were a school board and you're going to meet with the Swinomish tribe. Uh, you'll want to know how to speak with them, how to say their names properly. It's common. I know it's common sense. Um, uh, indigenous people are still here. Um, we're thriving. We're still here. There's a reason why we're still here. Don't use us in the past presence. These are just little tips when you come in to do government to government. I don't think we want to talk to the chairman of uh, Swinomish and say, as if they are in the past, uh, talk with them as if they're in the present. Um, these may seem small and common sense, but um, you would be amazed in how many government to government conversations where I have to pause a little bit, watch them make mistakes and then come back and be like, let me help you out. And they'll come back and do much better later on after the break. Uh, next. Slide, please. Um, couple more tips. Um, don't use your Native American people as a token. Don't ask them to do a Native acknowledgement. You don't have to do that. Uh, MJ, you're more than welcome to do one. Anyone can do one. It's just how you bring it through, how you present it. Um, it's an honor to say the words that you want to say. A um, couple of conversations here. Um, be real and authentic. Um, we don't want to be tokens. Um, we're here just as your neighbors. We're standing behind you in line at Safeway. We love Starbucks. Uh, we gripe about the price of gas, same way you do. Um, I remember I was in Stillaguamish and this little, I had long hair and uh, the dad was non-native and he was um, uh, you know, just astounded I'd done a presentation. And he came up and he's like, my little girl wants to know she can touch your hair because she thinks you're Pocahontas. And she, we, we didn't know you guys were still around here. Um, these are things, real life situations that we deal with. I was working out at the gym and an elder white lady came down and she, I was doing sit-ups when I could do sit-ups. And she touched my skin and she's like, is that the real color of your skin? Are you really that brown as Native American? Like, I don't tell you things to make the, anyone feel bad or anything. It's just, um, and I don't think any of you would act like that, but it's how we present and we hold ourselves as equals and be respectful in a room. And knowing and understanding how indigenous people think and feel is, um, can be, uh, it's, a, it's a teaching moment. And I think those people who come of, from a place of color clearly understand where I've been at some point in time. Um, next slide, please. A uh, little bit of facts. Uh, Bill, we talked a little bit about facts earlier, right? Believe, believing like, um, we weren't citizens, not until 1924, we're all Native Americans granted citizenship <laughs> as the first Americans. Um, therefore, juris, jur, juris, uh, juncture, only individuals who are members of federally recognized tribes and naturalized individuals are given the rights of the United States citizen. Presently, all Native Americans born within the territorial limits of the United States are law by citizens. Native Americans have privilege of voting 
a national election since 1924. However, every state had to pass it. So New Mexico, for example, did not extend the vote to Native Americans until 1962. Native Americans are of the highest race who fought in the military. They were fighting in the military before they could even vote in most of these states. And we, we say this because we go back to we're still here to be kind, uh, to rise above it. Because between all of the acts to destroy us, to take the Indian and leave the man, the boarding schools, the Dawes Act, the work, the, the work that's been done to remove Native Americans in our own community, 1962 was not that long ago. But work like you're doing here today and the bill 1426 that you guys brought to me in the Squally, it makes it a better place. You guys are rolling up the sleeves and doing the work because we don't forget the past. We just learn from it and make a better future. Um, next slide, please. Uh, let's go back into government to government. Uh, these were my tribal leaders. Uh, that participated in my swearing in on that day. Uh, First Nation chief, uh, First Nation chiefs came down and brought their language with it. Um, Governor Inslee and Frank Chop, who served as a speaker for 20 years. Frank Chop was the longest, longest standing speaker in the United States who was elected every year. Um, quite, quite a man. Uh, Republicans and Democrats stood with me. Um, our wonderful friend, uh, Willie Frank Jr. stood with me. Um, we celebrated this day because there was no other day like this that I've ever seen on the floor of the People's House. And it is something Washington State can be proud of because all of you did this. Next slide, please. Um, little, little things you gotta remember. Please don't giggle. I know this is common sense sometimes. Um, when you're talking to a tribal government, use a tribal name, Swinish Indian Tribal Community, Samish Nation, Nisqually Indian Tribe, use their full name, proper, it's, it's the right thing to do. Uh, use your First Nation name if you ever deal with First Nations, um, uh, Esquimalt, Musqueam, Tawasin, etc. Learn the pronunciation. Um, Indian Tribes is the legal term, correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, and, but every court case that we've seen, and this comes from tribal attorneys, they prefer in any language, written letters, policies, laws, use the language Indian tribes. Don't use indigenous people, Native Americans, et cetera. Because we always refer back to legal terms on whatever policy laws or guidances that you're gonna use. Um, federally recognized tribes with proper terminology, American Indian nations, proper term terminology. Uh, what not to use, and I know you guys know this, but it's amazing how many times you'll walk in and, hey chief, how you doing? shouldn't be calling them a chief. Um, hey, so you look like Pocahontas. Did you ever read her story? Like, amazingly, you guys would never do this, but going back, uh, sometimes that still happens. Um, going through, uh, next slide. Uh, who is a Native American? Um, I think we can go through this quite quickly on terminology. Uh, um, recent counts hit that there are 2.9 million Native Americans, including Native uh, Alaskans and Hawaiians. Um, there's no universal accepted rule for establishing persons' identities in Indian. Uh, these are just some background information that I'm not gonna go through holistically, but I thought in the slides when you guys took it home, you're welcome to read through it. The information, and I should put on note, all of this information came out of the legal work from the Native American Rights Fund which is the largest Native American legal firm in the United States. So just to let you guys know, I'm not making it up and pulling out of a hat. Next slide, please. Um, federally recognized tribes, only tribes who maintain a legal relationship to the US government through binding treaties, acts of Congress. And this is where some of your conversations came in earlier about you guys. Executive orders are officially recognized by the federal government. Duwamish is not a federally recognized tribe and nor can the state give them federal recognition, right? And I'm not saying I have an opinion on Duwamish at all, just as the example. Uh, the Chinook tribe is another. I think the Stevens tribe has four members and they want to be recognized. Um, once recognized, the tribe has a legal relationship with the United States. There are currently more than 500 and, this is an old slide, 77 federally recognized tribes including 200 village groups. So there are 217 of the 571 tribes 
just within Alaska alone. Go Alaska. Can you tell I'm Alaska Native? Uh, tribal sovereignty describes the right of federally recognized tribes to govern themselves, their lands, and their people. It also includes the existence of a government to government relationship with the tribe. This is important. A tribe is not a ward of the government. This goes back to what my good friend Bill said, but an independent nation with the right to form its own government, adjudicate legal cases within its borders, and we're working on that with the VAWA, right, to go off reservation to persecute those who harm our women, uh, levy taxes within the borders, establish its membership, and assign its own futures faith. The federal government has a trust responsibility to protect tribal lands, assets, resources, and treaty rights. So 10 years ago, I'm sitting in the room with a couple of tribal chairmen. I've got the head of Army Corps, the head of EPA, the head of um, the White House Affairs, a couple of uh, NRCS, USDA. And Chairman Cloudsby goes, OK, um, directors, secretaries, raise your hand if you have a trust responsibility to tribes. This was what, six years ago. And they all looked at each other and they're like, do you know? Do you know? None of them could answer. Army Corps, EPA, White House. It's in, this is under the Obama administration. So the Army Corps actually leans back to his staffer, his attorney, and is like, do they have a trust responsibility? So the, the attorney's like, say yes. Yes, we do. So even to this day, five years ago, still trying to understand as the United States federal agencies whether or not they have a trust responsibility and what that is. Next slide, please. Um, this is important. Uh, Indian tribes, again, this is a legal language in the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, Congress shall have power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among several states and within Indian tribes. In order to destroy the Indian tribes within the United States, they'd have to destroy the treaty. In order to destroy the treaty, they'd have to open up the Constitution. That is the only way they can rid us get rid of us, period. Um, Indian tribes are independent political entities that settled the lands prior to European settlement and the creation of the United States. They possess, as Bill puts it, an inherent sovereignty. Uh, Billy Frank always says, you can say it once, but you have to repeat, repeat, repeat. So I'm repeating a lot of what Bill did, but in just dropping it down to a technical level and something you could take it home to. Legal concept that recognizes the inherent authority of indigenous tribes to govern themselves within the borders of the United States, uh, tribe or sovereign nation. Next, next slide, please. So let's get to know, you know, our first Washingtonians, our neighbors, friends, and colleagues. Again, I'm the one standing in line at Starbucks going, come on, I got to get to work. Let's move faster. It's just me. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 29 federally recognized tribes, two states federally recognized tribes, six unrecognized tribes. So let's define what ceded land is. Most federal agencies and Indian tribes prefer to use the term ceded land. When describing areas where a tribe can cede, relinquish, and convey to the US all their inherent, and it breaks my heart to say this, I almost cried when Bill said it earlier, convey to the United States all their rights, their titles, and the interest in lands and country occupied by them at treaty signings or when reserve violations were established. I think Bill said all three times. Next slide, please. And we have this map. This map is, uh, both maps are, you can find on Goya's website. So good teaching moment. This just shows you um, the federally recognized tribes. Uh, the largest landowner tribes of Colville and Yakima. Yakima has up to almost 10,000 members. We're not as big as Navajo yet though. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, Washington Treaty. I, I'm not going to go through all of this, but gives you a good um, reflection and language coming out of the uh, the Washington Treaty. Uh, there are 24 tribes that have off reservation hunting within Washington State. Two of the tribes, the Confederate tribes, the Uintila Indian Reservation and the Nez Perce, are located outside of the state of Washington, but still have hunting rights within Washington. So there's some good facts here that you can use. Usual and the custom land. This treaty term was used by Stevens in 12 treaties in the Northwest United States. It described lands adjacent to the streams, rivers, or shorelines in which tribes usually travel was accustomed to the travel for the purpose of taking fish. So good stuff here. Uh, next slide, please. 
And I'll just rip through this. Um, you're going to find in the PowerPoint uh, all the different tribes. So we've got seven treaties, and underneath it, it tells you the tribes that are underneath the treaties. You can go into the back maps and you lay where those tribes are. If you don't have this map, maybe um, the State School Board would have it one day underneath the new president, but you would have a map of all the tribes, a map of the treaties, a map of where all the tribes' locations are, and then where all their school districts are. Because I still, to this day, when it comes to the Native Mascot, which tribe am I supposed to talk to? Do they still exist? How do I call them? And I'll get to that really quick. Next slide. Uh, you can click on these. When you go to my uh, PowerPoint, it'll take you directly to the treaties. You were asking where you can find the treaties in Washington. You could probably go to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, but you could also BIA, Boston Indians or whatever. Yeah. Very good point. I like that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, non signatory, uh, for various reasons, Nooksack, Semiamu, Lower Puyallup, and Slingy tribes do not take part in treaty councils. Through the rights of Nooksack were signed over by the Lummi Nation chief, Choitsu, without their presence. Uh, Samish attended. Uh, Samish is a center of the treaty tribe, but again, it's tucked under as one of the four tribes underneath the Swinomish when it comes to treaty rights. So Samish is a recognition of a treaty tribe, but it does not have treaty hunting and fishing rights, similar to Stokwami. Uh, wars are still happening over that. Next, next slide, please. Um, I'm talking, we talked about the Nooksack, uh, I'm sorry, um, Nisqually, the Medicine Creek tribes. These are the tribes that are up in the Point area, up in our area. Next slide. And for the purposes of this conversation here, I'm going to tell you really quickly in a nutshell how to prepare yourself for a government's government. Next slide. We're going to use the Swinomish Indian Tribal Community. You're going to get a worksheet and your staff should do this. It's really easy. Uh, create a worksheet. Um, you should know about the Swinomish tribes. You should know their governmental structure. You should know what their mission is, the demographic, the tribal economy, their employees, and who their Swinomish chairman is and try and figure out how to say his name. I want to say hello, Chairman Rudy Edwards from Swinomish. Hi, Chairman Edwards, good to meet you, but you should know this. They're going to want to know whether or not you read the treaty. They're going to want to know whether or not you know the treaty. They're going to want to know whether or not you understand usual and custom land. Um, in Yakima, have any of you attended a meeting and stood at the, yep, the tip of the arrow in Yakima Nation? If you haven't read their treaty before you go to Yakima Nation and know the demographics and the facts and the name of the people there, you might as well leave the room and hope to heck you get welcome back because it's a point of respect, because they'll know everything about you. Next, next slide, please. Um, government, government, sovereign authority, most valued asset uh, of um, the people of the Tulalip tribe. You'll find this within the mission with the language of Tulalip. Um, it'll teach you what the sovereign authorities have, and then government, government relationships recognized throughout executive orders, involves direct contact between agencies and tribes, recognizes the status of tribes as sovereign governments. So you're going to find that tribes are not going to realize, are not going to recognize government government if you're doing a conference call. Or a tribe may not call a government government relationship if you're talking to the senior policy advisor of the state school board. But they will recognize government government when Bill comes and meets with them as the chair of your state school. Next slide, please. I'm a little long-winded today. I'm a little excited about this. Um, this is how we're structured. Uh, we're structured no different than a county or a city. You all may know this, but take this slide and learn it. Um, we function just like a government. The tribe has everything. So you go in, you have the tribal, tribal board, tribal council, tribal committee, just like you do, like a planning committee, like a transportation committee, et cetera, and local government. I mean, that you have every different agency. We provide as many governmental services as a local government or a state. I would say much closer to a state instead. Healthcare, education, transportation, natural resources, environment. We have our own jails, we have our own wellness court, you name it, we got it, we're done. Next slide, please. These are just a couple points on how to engage. Um, call the tribal, I'm not gonna tell Bill this, he knows this, but one of you may be president or chair of the board one day. Uh, call the chairman's office, schedule an appointment, 
it's so interesting how many people say, how do you get a hold of a tribe? I'm like, Google the tribe, go to the chairman's office, make a phone call, <laughs> send an email, uh, uh, do the research on the departments, find out which department you want to chat with. Almost every tribe has a director of education. Most every tribe has a director of education. You contact the chairman, contact the director of education, send an email, fill out a phone call, and you're done. And then um, do a follow up because as a state legislator, I'm getting 1,500 emails a day. Uh, as a chairman, he's probably getting 3,000. So uh, do a follow up. It's not because we can't get a hold of you. We're just, yeah. And I still have no staff. So when you guys got a staff member you can send me, I'd love to have them in my office. Uh, next, next slide, please. Just things I talked about, uh, read the bio, get to know the treaty, go to the website, know their population, review the economic history. If you're going to meet face-to-face, -face, drive through the reservation if you're going to get there. So I see you got a new housing development. You got a new playground. Hey, it's great, you're putting in a new dock. It looks like you guys are going crabbing. These are nice things that a tribal chairman and tribal council says, that person did his homework and they care. Let's do business with them. Where's that MLU? Let's sign. Next slide, please. And that's it. Um, something just to remember, you're in my district, you're within Skagit. We're the first people of the Skagit and have called this place home since Skagit Memorial. We are your neighbors, your partners, your colleagues, and your friends. So a lot of technical information. The PowerPoint is yours to have. Um, thank you, guys. Okay, so we want to take time to thank you for uh, inviting us uh, to be here and sharing our knowledge with you. This is something that we all take very seriously, uh, obviously, and we're very passionate about, but we also are very humble and honored uh, to be asked by uh, the State Board of Education to, to, to be here and present in front of you. So we're humbled and honored by that. And I just want to thank you for all your time and your attention. Um, you know, as a tribal person, uh, to be standing here and, and doing this work together with you um, has never happened at this level before of, of state K-12 policy. It just has not happened. Um, we're hoping this continues. I know that um, PESB wants to follow. They want a similar presentation from us. We're hoping we can go further with other groups, whether that's WASDA or OSBI or whoever we need to go in front of to share our story. Uh, that's what we were tasked to do, right, by uh, not only Billy Frank Jr., but Chief Leshai, who said, teach your children, teach your children's children, and then teach their children also. So I'm very proud. I hold that near to my heart that I'm that generation. You know, I'm not Nisqually. I'm enrolled Macaw. But that's, that's a message from Chief Leshai directly to me. I take that personally. Teach your children, teach your children's children, and then teach their children also. And I get to do that. I get to do that. Um, and so I'm just very excited about that, obviously. So we want to thank you for allowing us to be here. Uh, we've hope you've enjoyed your time and learned a lot. And there's, you know, resources as far as emails and contacts. If you wanted us to do something, you know, if you have a friend that's a principal somewhere or someone that you think this presentation would do right by, we 